welcome. Let's go ahead and find a seat here. Come on in from the halls. Have a seat in here or uh, over in the overflow room on the uh, north side of the building. I uh, want to welcome you all here, uh, especially guests and visitors. Uh, welcome and uh, thank you for joining with us this morning as we uh, worship the Lord together. Um, my name is Tommy. I'm one of the guys preparing for ministry here at Countryside. And I uh, just want to thank you all for joining with us. Uh, we're going to start this morning um, with God's word in Psalm 118, verses 28 and 29. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let's stand and give thanks to the Lord this morning. Mm -hmm. 
get to celebrate communion in today. Please be seated. If you haven't gotten a chance to grab a communion cup, you can grab one from one of the tables in the back. And we invite every believer in Christ here this morning to join us in taking these communion elements. If you're new, you may be wondering who this little cup is for. Well, it's for all who believe in Jesus Christ and have been saved by his grace through faith. It's not just for people who are members of Countryside. But what if you are unsure about what you believe about God? What if you believe in God, but you've been hiding something in your life that you know is wrong and have not been willing to confess and turn away from it? Or what if you're under church discipline here or at another church? Well, if that's you this morning, then you should not take the juice and the cracker. And that's not a punishment for you. It's not meant to make you feel unwelcome. But we're committed to taking communion in the way clearly instructed by the Bible so that God is glorified and so that no one who takes these elements takes them in an unworthy manner. So that's what we'd ask this morning. If you don't participate, you're not missing out on something extra that God is giving. What God gave for you was his son, Jesus Christ. And that little cracker and juice are a tangible reminder for us that Jesus' blood shed and his broken body provided life and hope and joy and peace and victory to all who believe in him. So every single one of us this morning needs to take a moment while the music plays to consider where we stand before the holy and just and perfect judge over all, over all creation. Ask God to search your heart, to try you, to reveal your thoughts, and to make known to you any wickedness or idolatry or disobedience. And take this time to repent from it today, praising him for his unrelenting forgiveness and mercy. So let's quiet our hearts first together. You can go ahead and open up your communion cup, take the wrappers off. And as you look at the little cracker and the little cup of juice, these elements this morning, let's consider Jesus' willing submission to God's plan. The night that Jesus was arrested, he had sent Judas out knowing that soon his captors would come to drag him into an unfair trial, into a brutal public death. But consider this. Jesus was not captured because he was bad at hiding. He hadn't become unpopular because he didn't have any necessary military might. He was not mocked and jeered because he wasn't quick-witted enough to stand up for himself. He wasn't tortured because he lacked strength to defend himself. And he wasn't accused because he was without the right representation during his trial. And he wasn't killed because he lacked the power to crush his foes. Jesus was killed because God sent him to die. God was calling him to set aside his infinite power, to refuse to call the legions of angels at his disposal, to silence his sharp and eloquent tongue, to endure the desertion and betrayal of all of the friends that he held most dear on the earth, and to surrender his body to be tortured to death 
even though he was faultless. And the response of Jesus to that call was willing submission. He said, yes. Through tears, as he prayed in the garden, he said, yes, to anguish and abuse and agony. As God revealed to him the horrors he would endure, the blood vessels around his sweat glands and his forehead ruptured from the intense strain and blood sweat dripped down his face and he said yes to the Father's will. Even knowing that you and I would look at the truth about him one day and say, no way. He looked to the Father and said, yes. Yes, I will bear the weight of their guilt. Yes, I will be falsely accused. Yes, I will bear the wrath of mankind and endure the wrath of God so that through my death, they can be given life. Yes, I will fulfill each and every promise of God to the smallest detail according to your will. Yes, I will endure the punishment without complaint until full satisfaction has been provided. Yes, I will give my body to be crushed and my blood to be shed for those who hate me and rebel against me and who don't deserve to be saved. He said, yes. Isaiah 53.10 says, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. Jesus understood the call and he willingly submitted himself to all that God had prepared. He says this about his life in John 10, 18. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. In Isaiah 50, verses 5 through 6, the prophesied Messiah says, The Lord God has opened my ear. I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who would strike, and my cheeks to those who would pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. In Isaiah 53, we see that he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Why endure this? Why not just erase this whole rebellious horde of humankind and begin anew with a creation that would give him the glory of which he is worthy? Why be willingly despised and rejected by men? Because in his divine, selfless love, God planned out of the anguish of his own soul to bring satisfaction for our sin, to display the righteousness of Jesus Christ and to count us righteous by bearing our iniquities upon his own self. That is divine love. Christ willingly laid down his life so that we could experience his love, so that our sin could be dealt with finally, and so that we could have victory over death in his resurrection to life. God's plan for salvation is beautiful, and Christ's willing submission for us was perfect. Praise Jesus this morning that for your sake and mine, he said yes to his body being broken and his blood being poured out in willing submission to God's plan. I would like to ask for one of our deacons, Phil Flaggard, to pray for the bread. Father, thank you for the great privilege that it is to pray to you. Father, thank you for the only price acceptable for our broken sin. And as we hold this wafer in our hand, Lord, that it always remind us that the greatest gift to humankind was your, broken, your son's broken body on the cross. Thank you for the greatest gift to the world. In Christ's name, amen. Let's eat together. I'd like to ask another one of our deacons, Ryan Bucher, to pray for the juice. Father and holy God, it's, it's a 
it's astounding to us that you would, you would have this plan that would bring us into your glory, that would allow us to be part of your family, that would allow us to be called your friends. God, um, we're so thankful for the example of Jesus, how perfect an example and how scripture gives us every element that we need to know so that we can live a life that would honor you, God. We ask you for forgiveness, and we're so grateful that you willingly give it. We're thankful for the blood of Christ that flowed because of his submission. God, we need to submit our hearts to you. Help us to do it in your name. In remembrance of him, let's drink together. Let's stand together and continue worshiping the Lord this morning. 
able to sing those words uh, honestly this morning. Um, Christ is all we have, and Christ is all we need. Um, let's pray together before we open the Word of God. God, thank you for this time we get to spend in your Word. Thank you for the hope that we have in the Gospel, the hope we are able to hear proclaimed in communion and in our singing. I pray that you would help us to be focused this morning that your word would be clear, and that you would change us as we consider Jesus Christ this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you may be seated. As you're seated and getting situated, go ahead and turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to continue our series in the Gospel of Matthew this morning. As you turn there, consider this question. Have you ever been tempted to sin? For some of you, as you think about that question, have I ever been tempted to sin? Um, your first response is going to be, of course, I'm human. Some of you may think in your mind and try to justify yourself in thinking about temptation. Well, I'm not that bad, or at least I'm not as bad as that one guy. And some of you may immediately be filled with shame and guilt because you know and feel an intense struggle with temptation and sin. Maybe you're saying this morning, I can't help but give in to temptation. Well, what if I'm only human, I'm not as bad as someone else, or I can't help it, are not the best responses to temptation? What we'll see in Matthew chapter 4 this morning is Jesus who is tempted to sin. And what that speaks to in the world that we live in is the reality that we all have experienced, the reality that we all face in a fallen world. As Paul said in Romans, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so as, as we consider temptation this morning, uh, the answer that we all must give and acknowledge is yes, I have been tempted to sin. And it goes beyond that because we all must admit, yes, I have sinned. But what we'll see this morning is that for all of us who have sinned, there's hope because of Jesus. There's hope for you in your struggle for sin. Well, our theme in Matthew is this. Because Jesus is the Messiah King, we must worship and follow him. And last week, we saw a glimpse of his glory as Otto preached through Matthew 3, um, through the baptism of Jesus. And what we see is a remarkable picture of the Trinity as Jesus is baptized and God the Father speaks from heaven his approval of Jesus. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the Spirit descends on him. And we go straight from that picture of Jesus and his glory to our text this morning. So let's read that together. Um, you can remain seated. We'll read Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Verse 5, then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Verse 10, Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him. And behold, angels came 
and were ministering to him. Matthew's description of the temptation of Jesus presents us with this. It presents us with Jesus, the Messiah, the Son who never sinned. And as we see the narrative move here, Matthew quickly goes from this pinnacle of glory, God speaking over his son, to temptation in the wilderness. Jesus goes to the wilderness to face temptation from the, from the devil. And let's spend a few moments just talking through this temptation. The essence of the temptation is this. Satan comes to Jesus when he's weak, he's hungry, he hasn't eaten for 40 days, and he attempts to convince Jesus away from suffering, toward manufactured glory, and toward a limited kingdom. Now this is the first we've seen of the, this character, the devil, in the book of Matthew. But this character is not new to the pages of scripture, because this is the same old devil that we find opposing God in the Old Testament. This is Lucifer, the angel who sought God's throne. This is the serpent who deceived and tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden. And what we find here is Satan is still on the same mission as he was then. To thwart God's plan and to exalt himself. And so twice he presents Jesus with this test to prove that he's the Son of God. And he says, in essence, if you are the Son of God, remember who's just spoken that he is. God the Father, speaking from heaven. And Satan says, if you are the Son of God, prove it by obeying my command to serve yourself. That's what each temptation boils down to as he speaks to Jesus. It comes down to this. Question God's word, listen to lies, and serve yourself instead of serving God. And in the first two tests that Satan gives Jesus... He's not presenting Jesus with something that's inherently evil. Think about it. It's not evil for Jesus to turn stones into bread. Jesus has every capability to do that. It's not inherently wrong for Jesus to receive fame from a spectacular accomplishment. And it's especially not wrong for Jesus to experience that glory because of who he is. But the underlying moral factor in this temptation is Jesus' ability to remain committed to the will of his Father. So while Jesus could turn stones into bread, doing so would be a selfish act and would take away the glory of the Father in order for him to serve himself. For Jesus to throw himself off the temple and selfishly use his power for this manufactured glory and praise of man would be doing so, it's receiving glory apart from the will of God. So those are the first two tests. And the third test is a little bit different. But the final test from Satan is an offer of glory. Satan offers Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. This is an appeal to Jesus to gain a kingdom without suffering. Satan wants Jesus to take a shortcut on his way to the kingdom. But Jesus knows that glory is coming. And glory is coming, we'll get there in our study of Matthew, but the glory that's coming is not glory apart from suffering, it's glory that's going to come through suffering. So as we recognize the nature of this temptation, we need to recognize um, in our own hearts that the nature of the temptation we face is the same. Somewhere inside every temptation that you face is the same offer. Question God's goodness. Love yourself rather than God. And every human being up to this point has given in to these lies. Beginning with Adam and Eve, but not so with Jesus. Because Jesus is the Son who never sins. So, what does the temptation of Jesus tell us about Jesus? What's the point of Matthew telling us this story? 
Why do we need to know this? Well, there's three important truths that this reveals about Jesus, and we'll work our way through those now. The first truth is this. The temptation of Jesus reveals his true humanity. The temptation of Jesus reveals his true humanity. Matthew wants us to know that Jesus is human. And so we see Jesus as the human son who will never sin. Jesus' humanity is very important for us to understand. We need to think about this. We need to recognize this. This is why Matthew included back in chapter 1 the story of his birth. We need to know that Jesus was born as a human because Jesus is human. In order for the Messiah to fulfill what he's come to do, he must actually be human. And I think our tendency when it comes to understanding Jesus is to downplay his humanity. When we, when we do this, though, we end up with a disproportionate view and disproportionate understanding of who he is. We think of Jesus as being more God than he is human. We look at Jesus' life and think, well, he's God. Of course he never sinned. Or we use Jesus' divine nature as an excuse for our own sin. Hey, I'm not Jesus. I'm just a human. Well, Matthew wants us to see that Jesus is 100% God, but at the same time, Jesus is 100% man. And this is 100%, or maybe I should say 200% important to our faith. Let's look at the evidence Matthew gives us here for Jesus' humanity. Uh, the first is this. Jesus is human because we see Jesus in this passage as dependent. Jesus is dependent. And he's dependent in four ways. First, we see Jesus is dependent on the Spirit for leading. So if you look at verse 1, Matthew describes Jesus as being led up by the Spirit. Jesus follows the leading of the Spirit wherever the Spirit will lead him. In his humanity, Jesus must follow the Spirit. But when we think about God, God has no need to be led, does he? God is the one who leads. But here we find Jesus, the God-man, in his humanity, being dependent on the leading of God's Spirit. In this way, Jesus is like every human being. Every human being must follow the leading of God's Spirit. And Jesus does this perfectly. As he's led into the wilderness toward danger. Notice the words that are used there. Matthew says he is led by the Spirit to the wilderness. Why? For the express purpose of being tempted by the devil. And this tells us something about the Spirit's leading. Listen. Don't believe the lie that God will never take you through trial, that God will never lead you towards suffering or hardship. Don't believe the lie that God will never allow you to be tempted by sin. If this is true, how can the Spirit of God lead Jesus here? He's led by the Spirit toward temptation. And Jesus is dependent on the Spirit in his humanity. But second, we see that Jesus depends on the Father. Jesus depends on the Spirit. He's also depending on God the Father. And this is shown through his fast. If you notice in verse 1, or in verse 2, it says, After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Now, fasting is a part of Israel's prescribed religious rituals. And so this is something that would commonly be done by God's people. Fasting was to accompany certain sacrifices and vows. In fact, the Day of Atonement, one of the highest religious days for God's people, was to be celebrated in conjunction with fasting. And if, if you read through the history of Israel in the Old Testament, you'll find many key leaders um, fasting, setting aside f specifically 40 days of fasting to seek God in prayer. And while Matthew doesn't mention prayer in these verses, prayer is an understood part of of fasting. Because fasting is to set aside eating, to set aside the time that it would take to prepare to eat for a dedicated time of intense prayer. And so Jesus' fast 
is a time of prayer and dependence on the Father for what is going to come now in his temptation. He's prepared himself for 40 days. And what Jesus declares by his fast in the wilderness is that he depends on God more than he depends on his food. And we'll, we see this clearly in his response to Satan. So under the first temptation that he receives, in verse 4, he says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus is dependent on the Spirit. Jesus is dependent on the Father. And third, we see that Jesus depends on the Word of God. Jesus depends on the Word of God. We see this in every response he gives to Satan. In his weakness, Jesus goes to the truth of what has already been spoken by God. And the truth is what counters the lies of temptation. And so three times Jesus says, it is written. And he proceeds to quote a verse out of the book of Deuteronomy. And this is important for a Jewish audience to understand that Jesus is reaching back to what God revealed through Moses. And this is the word of God, and it points toward Jesus. Notice first that Jesus says, Scripture says, man shall not live by bread alone. And so he's refuting the lie by saying that there's something greater to live for than bread. And what he lives for is every word that comes from the mouth of God. The second temptation, Jesus says, Scripture says, you shall not put the Lord, your God, to the test. Because to test God is to doubt his goodness, to doubt his faithfulness, and to reject his will. These are things that Jesus, as the sinless son, cannot do. Third, Scripture has prohibited any false form of worship. And Jesus says this. He says, you shall not worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve, in verse 10. If you remember uh, the Ten Commandments that God gave to his people, the very first command was this, to have no other God before the true God, Yahweh. And so as Jesus depends on the word of God, he's kept pure through the word of God. And this speaks to us as we face our own temptations to sin. What is our best weapon against temptation? Well, it's the word of God. This is what Jesus used in his defense against temptation. But friends, you will not be able to overcome sin if you do not know the word of God. You cannot taste God's goodness unless you taste it through the word. The power to overcome sin comes through the truth of the word of God. And so as Jesus, the Messiah, the son who never sins, depends on scripture, so we must depend on scripture. And so we see Jesus is dependent on the, the spirit of on the Father, on the Word. And fourth, we see another aspect of his dependence, and this is probably the most human need that we see in Jesus here, and that's his need for physical food. He's dependent on God to sustain him, but also he's really hungry because he hasn't eaten for 40 days. And so he's weak, and he's tired, and he's hungry. His human body needs food in order to survive. And I don't know about you, I don't know how long you've ever gone without eating, but I know how hungry I get after missing one meal. How tired would you be after 40 days of fasting? Listen, don't brush over the fact that Jesus is hungry. Matthew includes that here for a reason. Because it reveals the humanity of Jesus in a way that we can all relate to. We've all been hungry. In fact, some of us are hungry right now. But remember, Jesus lasted 40 days. You can last another 20 minutes or so. Jesus is hungry in the wilderness as a real human with a real body. And we see his humanity in his dependence. Well, there's a second way we see his humanity, and that's in the temptation itself. Jesus is human because he is tempted. The very fact that Jesus is tempted is proof of his humanity. Now, as we consider Jesus, we see 
in, in the Bible, we have, to con- we have to consider this text in light of the rest of the Bible. And what we find of God in Scripture is that God cannot be tempted. James states this clearly in James 1.13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. And so evidence of being human is the ability to be tempted by evil. God cannot be tempted with evil, but Jesus, in his humanity, is tempted by Satan. And we see that temptation coming in very human ways. He exists in a body. He's living in time and space. He's limited in where he is. He's hungry. He's weak. Jesus is human in his temptation. Well, the author of Hebrews actually expounds on this idea of Jesus experiencing temptation. And he he uses it as a source of comfort for the church as we face temptation. Let me read you Hebrews 4, verse 15. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one in every respect, one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And so we see Jesus, a human who's tempted by sin. And because Jesus has been tempted by sin, he's able to sympathize with human weakness and temptation because he's been tempted in every respect as a human. In fact, in his temptation, Jesus is experiencing something he's never had to experience before becoming a human. I don't know if you've thought about that before. But he's never experienced temptation before he was a human. Because God cannot be tempted by evil. Now, the distinction between Jesus' response to temptation and our response to temptation is this. Jesus never sinned. We fall for temptation so often that it becomes really hard to distinguish between temptation and sin itself. But what Matthew is communicating to us here is that Jesus has been tempted and still remained sinless. As we consider temptation, James helps us a little bit when he explains this in James 1.14. He kind of explains the, the path that temptation takes that results in sin. In James 1.14, he says, Each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. For Jesus, desire has never conceived and given birth to sin. Because Jesus' desires are to please the Father. Jesus has no sinful desires in him. And so he remains sinless while still experiencing temptation to sin. One thing that this tells us as we think about our own lives and, and temptation to sin is that it is not a sin to be tempted to sin. Sometimes it can be, but temptation in and of itself does not equal sin because if it does, then Jesus is not sinless because he faced temptation. But what happens is our our sinful hearts meld sin and temptation together uh, because we not only love sin, uh, we love to be tempted by sin, and we have desires in us that desire that sin. And so, in many cases, it's impossible to find a place in our own hearts, where temptation and sin are separate. Jesus has no sinful desires. And so this actually sets Jesus apart from every other human being who ever has lived. Now this raises a couple questions as we consider the temptations that Jesus faces. If you're like me, um, you're asking these questions. If you're not asking these questions... That's okay. We still need to talk about them. The first is this. Are these real temptations, then, for Jesus? 
Or is this just a facade? Is, is Jesus just going through the motions here? Well, based on what Matthew tells us here, and what Scripture tells us, and the theological implications of Jesus not actually experiencing temptation, we must conclude that, yes, these are real temptations. In fact, these temptations are, in one sense, more real than any temptation that you have ever faced. Here's what I mean by that. You face temptation up to a certain point, and then you give in. You've never remained sinless. Jesus has felt the increasing weight of temptation and resistance to sin his entire life. You have never maintained sinlessness, but Jesus has. Are these temptations real for Jesus? Yes. Which leads us to another question. Since these are real temptations, could Jesus have committed sin here? Could Jesus have given in to Satan's temptation and sinned? Well, this answer becomes a little bit less clear. But what this question is, is speaking to is what theologians call the impeccability of Christ. The idea that Jesus could not sin. And as we ask the question, could Jesus have given in to this temptation, we've got to be really, really careful that we don't create a uh, heretical, hypothetical situation here. Because we have to deal with what has been given to us. And what we see happening is that Jesus never gives in to sin. Was Jesus actually capable of sin? Well, we know that Jesus never gave in to sin. And the reason for that is because in his godness, he cannot sin. His human flesh is tempted. But because Jesus is also God, he does not sin. And that's good news for us. That's good news for us because that means there's hope for us in our struggle with sin. But Jesus' resistance to temptation is not negated if he's not actually able to. To, to sin. Think of it this way. One, one commentator I read um, used this illustration. It was really helpful. Um, you can imagine the greatest and mightiest army that has ever existed. And you can't say that this mighty army can never be attacked, even though any attack that comes against it will not be successful. The same is true with Jesus. Is Jesus God? Yes. Is Jesus human? Yes. Jesus is the Son who never sins. And friends, the humanity of Jesus is just as important to our salvation as his deity. Because Jesus must be human if he's going to be the Messiah King that sits on David's throne. Jesus must be human if he's going to be a representative for all humans. Like the first Adam represented all humans... Jesus is going to represent those who turn to him by faith. And Jesus must be human if he's going to fulfill all the righteousness that he has come to do on behalf of all sinners. And you'll see that back in chapter 3, verse 14. This is what he's come to do. To fulfill all righteousness. If Jesus is not human, we have no hope. But what we see in this passage this morning gives us hope because Jesus is is as human as you are. Well, the second thing that this temptation reveals to us about Jesus is that Jesus is totally submissive. So the temptation of Jesus reveals his total submissiveness. And we see here in his submission, like we talked about in communion already, that Jesus is the humble son who will never sin. Jesus is the humble son who will never sin. And the obvious point of submission in this passage is that Jesus has humbled himself to a mission that must go through temptation. Jesus has submitted himself to this temptation. Consider the great humility of the Son. Jesus, the creator of the universe, he created Satan. 
Yet he set aside certain aspects of his attributes in order to become human. In his human body, he's limited to time and space, and he actually has to learn things as a human. This takes humility. And as God, he's never been tempted. He's never been confronted with the ability to be tempted, but now he faces it, and he must learn obedience, as the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 5, 8. Jesus' humility is highlighted particularly in the elements and the settings surrounding this temptation. Think about it. Would a king go to spend time in the wilderness, away from the comforts of his palace? Would a king go without eating for 40 days? Not a normal king. But Jesus does because he's the humble son, ready to take the worst that the devil has to offer. So he submits himself in humility to be tempted. And the reason he does that is because he's already submitted himself to the will of the Father. Now it's difficult um, to explain the Trinity and all the nuances of how God functions as a three-in-one God. And I've probably waited too long in this sermon to do this. We've been talking about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And we see the Trinity on display here. God is the Father, the one speaking from heaven over his Son. God is also the humble Son, Jesus, who's become human to fulfill the Father's will. And God is the Holy Spirit, descended on the Son to accomplish the will of the Father in and through the Son. And that's really hard to wrap your mind around because there's nothing else that exists that's like the Trinity. But this is the God that's real. This is the God we find in our Bible. And somehow, this, this three-in-one God, co-equal in existence and glory, is able in its distinction between Father, Son, and Spirit, to submit to the other's will. And that submission of the Son to the Father is because he loves you. And he's as committed to what God, want, God the Father wants as God the Father is. What this means is that Jesus has not come to serve himself. He has come to fulfill the will of the Father. Will it be easy? No. He faces the temptation of a shortcut here. He's tempted to use his power for selfishness. Feed yourself. He's offered cheap glory with no suffering. And in just a few short years, Jesus will stare down the barrel of God's wrath. Even though he's never sinned, even though he's never given into temptation, he's done nothing to deserve the wrath of God, and he will face this wrath and say these words, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus is humbly committed to the will of his Father. And this is what protects him in the face of temptation. For Jesus to give in will be to forfeit his mission. For Jesus to give in will be to stray from the will of the Father. And so the temptation of Jesus reveals his humanity. It reveals his humility. And third, as we look at the interaction between Jesus and Satan, we see that this temptation reveals his authority as the Messiah King. The temptation of Jesus reveals his authority as the Messiah King. And what we see of Jesus here is that Jesus is the chosen son who will never sin. Jesus is the chosen son who will never sin. And as you read through the narrative of verses 1 through 11, notice in the entire conversation who is the one holding the authority. It's Jesus. Because Jesus responds at every turn to Satan with authoritative truth. At every turn, he responds with what is true. Each time Satan speaks, what is he doing? Well, he's lying, 
twisting the truth, trying to manipulate Jesus. And each time Jesus responds with authority. This is what God's word says. Was everything that Satan said all lies? Was he telling any truth? Well, yeah, Satan actually quotes scripture. I don't know if you noticed that. But when, when Satan says, for it is written, and he quotes the psalmist from Psalm 91. Satan actually speaks the truth there. And we can, we can go back to the Garden of Eden when Satan deceives Eve. There is some truth to his statement that he gives her, that she would be like God. Because in rebelling against God and eating the fruit... Adam and Eve did learn the distinction between good and evil. And sometimes temptation is very deceitful. Sometimes sin looks like the right thing to do. And when Satan uses scripture to tempt Jesus, he's mishandling the truth. He's not using scripture authoritatively. Because submitting to the word means that you believe that it's true. Satan uses the word of God to to twist it carelessly for selfish reasons. But Jesus always responds to the truth. And Jesus' knowledge and use of scripture and temptation tells us something about how we ought to utilize scripture in our own temptation. Friends, truth always holds the authority over lies. Well, we see authority in another way here, as Jesus responds to Satan, and and we see that his authority comes from his deity. And his response to Satan, um, in verse 10, when when he says that it's written that you shall not worship anyone besides the true God, he's speaking of himself. Worship does not belong to Satan. Worship is only reserved for God. Satan has no right to demand worship here. But Jesus, on the other hand, is the worthy one of worship. And this is why he holds authority over Satan. Matthew shows us Jesus is human, but he also shows us that Jesus is God. And imagine the gross evil that it would be for God to worship Satan. Jesus will not give in to this temptation because he is God. And the third and and really the most clear evidence we see of the authority of Jesus is found in the command that he gives to Satan at the end. Jesus commands Satan and what happens? Satan obeys him. What I love about the conclusion here is that while Satan has come to a weak Jesus to tempt him to sin... It seems like he has the authority. Satan ends up obeying Jesus in the end. All Satan can do is offer Jesus a choice. Jesus is the one left giving the command that's obeyed. Matthew says in verse 11, And the devil left him after Jesus said, Be gone. Jesus needs nothing of what Satan is offering to him. Because he is the Messiah King. Jesus does not need to bow down and worship the devil. Because in his weakness, Jesus still has more authority than Satan ever will. Satan has zero power to turn the will of Jesus. And no way to actually provide what he's promising in his temptation. But friends, while Jesus needs nothing of what Satan is offering him. He humbles himself to this human temptation so that he can be the son who never sins. And in light of this temptation, consider the ministry that Jesus is about to embark on. Jesus is going to perform miracles and teach in a way that reveals who he is. With authority. Jesus is going to show himself glorious to the world in remarkable ways. Here's the distinction between what Jesus is going to do in his ministry 
and what Satan was trying to tempt Jesus to do. None of the ways that Jesus will act are self-centered. Think about the things that Jesus did for people in his miracles. He healed the sick. He raises dead people to life. He heals the crippled and the blind. He feeds thousands of people. None of these acts were done exclusively for himself. Because Jesus' miracles always meet a real need for someone else. Jesus will receive glory, but not the glory you would expect a king to receive. Not the glory that the Messiah deserved. Because Jesus is going to receive glory as the king of the Jews who suffers. And in his suffering, he's going to do much more than go without bread. His body is going to be broken. And his life is going to be poured out in crucifixion. His lifeless body will be laid in a tomb constructed out of stone. Jesus will be cast down into the grave, but the angels will not keep him from death. Because it is through his death that Jesus is going to be glorified. It is through intense suffering that Jesus suffers his greatest purpose. Sorry, Jesus serves his greatest purpose. Glory will come, but not without suffering. Glory will come, but not without death. Ultimately, Jesus is going to be the one that Satan will bow his knee to in the end. Jesus is the authoritative son who never sins. And for Jesus to have given in to temptation here would mean the end of all hope for us. If Jesus gives in to temptation here, it would undo everything that Matthew has told us about Jesus so far, and it completely unravels our faith. Jesus must be the sinless Son. And that fills us with hope. As we conclude this morning, let me present just a few implications for us as we consider the temptation of Jesus. The first is this. Because you are human... You must acknowledge that you are susceptible to temptation and sin. And while temptation morphs itself into many different looking fronts, it ultimately boils down to the same thing. Self-centeredness. Glory without suffering. And as we see Jesus' temptation, we must confess our own propensity to temptation and our own inability to perfectly resist it. And second, as we identify sin in our lives and recognize our weak and vulnerable condition, we must recognize the importance of Scripture in our battle with temptation. And now, Scripture is no magic mantra that repels demons or miraculously casts out temptation or desires. That's not how Jesus is using Scripture here. No, Scripture is truth that will root into your heart and will lead you toward change as you believe it. Scripture will direct your thoughts, it will control your desires, it will strengthen you to stand against temptation. Friends, do you know God's word enough to be able to wield it in the face of temptation? In your battle with lust, in your battle with anger, in your battle with selfishness, If Jesus must depend on the word of God, you must depend on the word of God. And our third implication is this. Because Jesus is the son who never sins, rest in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we must do this. We must rest in his righteousness because Jesus has resisted temptation in your place. Listen. Your salvation does not depend on your own sinlessness. Your salvation does not depend on your own ability to resist sin, because if it did, you would have no hope. Praise God that our salvation depends on the sinless Son, Jesus. Jesus is sympathetic to your temptation because he himself has been tempted. 
And friends, Jesus will strengthen and sustain and comfort and satisfy you in the face of temptation. So rest in the finished work that he's done for you. Run to Jesus and find mercy and grace in your time of need. We must rest in his righteousness to save us from our sin. Finally, as we consider the son who never sins, we must repent of our sin and find forgiveness through Jesus' sinless sacrifice. Now, John the Baptist's message back in chapter 3 was, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus' message in just a few short verses in chapter 4 is the same. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And because we have all sinned, we must turn from our sin and find forgiveness through the sacrifice of the sinless Son. And what this means is that we cannot excuse away our sin by attributing it to someone else. You can't use the excuses that we've already mentioned at the beginning. You can't use the excuse, well, Satan made me do it, or I was tired and hungry, or I'm only human. Responding to your sin in this way fails to recognize the weight and depth of your sin, and it diminishes the depth and the greatness of the forgiveness that Jesus offers to you. Jesus never sinned, not so that you can excuse away your sin, but so that you can be forgiven of your sin and changed. And friends, this morning, if you've never faced the reality of your sin and what that means for you, standing before a holy and righteous God, if you've never trusted Christ for your salvation, consider Jesus this morning. Consider Jesus the human son who will never sin. Admit your own sin and in confession before him. Consider Jesus, the humble son, who will never sin and humble yourself before him in repentance. Friends, consider Jesus, the chosen son, who will never sin and recognize his authority and bow your knee before him. Will you turn to Jesus this morning? Will you turn to Jesus today? Friends, the Son who never sins is your only hope. Let's pray together. Father, we are nothing without the sinless Son. We praise you for humbling yourself to the point of temptation so that you can be righteous on our behalf. Thank you that the sinless Son endured great suffering and trial, taking the wrath that we deserve on himself so that we can be forgiven. And God, take these truths and work them deep inside our heart so that we would love the sinless Son more than we love our sin. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand together as we conclude in sing. one great way for us to uh, respond to the message that we've heard this morning in affirming these truths is affirming the value of the word of God with just a, an old song that's a familiar tune, a classic hymn, How Firm a Foundation. I'm thinking about the words as we sing. Um, just a, a brief word about this song. What I love is that there's four verses, but verses two, three, and four are all the perspective of God for us. And so it's really unique in the song and uh, an excellent um, song for us to sing in worship in response to what we've heard today. So let's, let's worship the Lord together. Mm -hmm. 
Powerful, powerful message. I'm glad that Phil had that and not me, because that would have been about five hours. And he did a great job of getting it in the time he did. So, wow, I'm, ch I'm challenged. A few things before we go. Uh, last chance to leg register for teen camp, I believe today. <laughs> junior camp registration is open online. You can do that, just so you know, the first 36 boys, the first 36 girls get to go. If you're not one of those first 36, you don't get to come. So. And I'm, I'm pretty confident we're going to fill up this year. Um, do something weird today. Um, if you um, don't know someone sitting around you, turn around and say hi. Turn around and say hi, introduce yourself, tell them your name. Um, not right now. I'm not done yet. <laughs> not right now. And you guys know each other. What are you doing? <laughs> so do that this morning. Don't let somebody sprint out of here. They're just going to get wet. So introduce yourself. I want to close with these words. Phil mentioned one verse, but in these words I find great hope through the sinlessness and the temptation of Christ. And they're found in Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 through the end of the chapter. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And here's the response. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may obtain, may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Run to him this week. You're dismissed.